Welcome to lecture 27. In this lecture we're going to talk about entropy production and the entropy equation a little bit more. And then we'll do a couple of examples. The picture that you see on the screen is from a CFD simulation, that's computational fluid dynamics simulation, of the movement of humid air in a solar still. The, uh, the solar still, a solar still is a device used to produce fresh, clean water from contaminated water, something like salt water, for example, via evaporation, where the energy is coming in from the sun. And in the CFD simulation that's shown here, the colors correspond to the entropy generation or entropy production term. So it shows where irreversibility is being generated in the solar still for some various cases. Regions with uh, red color correspond to where a large amount of entropy production is occurring, and blue is where it's, it's not occurring. The sun will be coming in from the, the top here, and so this, this, this panel right up at the top is a, um, is a glass panel and the bottom down down here corresponds to where the surface of the water would be and this is an e these are edges the uh, as you can see in these pictures from the CFD simulation you get a lot of entropy production produced near the boundaries and then you get these kind of these are these are recirculation zones it's where the humid air is recirculating around and there's some entropy production as a result of that you get a lot of entropy production due to thermal gradients as well as some viscous effects and such. And then uh, the diffusive one corresponds to some mixing of the material. So the, the point of me showing you this is that um, by using computational fluid dynamics, um, this is just a way to solve the, the second law, the first law, conservation of mass and linear momentum numerically. We can see where irreversibilities are occurring in the system, and we can then try to redesign the device, the solar still, for example, to try to reduce those irreversibilities and improve the efficiency of the device. So that's something that we'll talk about a little bit more in today's lecture. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, recall that we have the entropy equation, as shown here on the slide. There are two different forms here. The top form is the rate form. So this would be the rate at which you're producing entropy in your control volume. The summation term with the subscript in. This is the rate at which you're bringing in entropy through the inlets. The second summation term is the rate at which you're removing entropy from your control volume through the outlets. The integral over the boundary, this is uh, the reversible entropy that we're bringing into the control volume through heat and then we have the rate of entropy production term at the end and then if you integrate that equation in time you'll get the second equation here this is the total change in entropy in the control volume this is the total amount of entropy you've brought in in the inlet this total amount of entropy that you've removed the total entropy uh, the reversible entropy that um, comes from the heat coming in, and then this is the entropy production term. And of course, we've said this many times before, the entropy production term is used to determine whether the process is internally reversible, in which case the entropy production term should be zero, internally irreversible, in which case the entropy production term is greater than zero, and if the entropy production term is negative, then that's impossible, it would violate the, the second law. So, as I mentioned in the introduction to the lecture here, um, we can use entropy production to determine where the irreversibility is occurring. So, in some of the problems that we've been solving, they, co they consist of a collection of components in a system. For example, when we do a power cycle, you'll have a turbine, uh, there's a uh, condenser here, there'll be a pump, and a boiler and you have this whole cycle, right? If we apply the entropy equation to each one of these components, so to the turbine, to the condenser, to the pump, to the boiler, and look at the entropy production term for each of those, where the entropy production term is largest would tell us which 
device is um, bringing the most irreversibility and that would allow us to figure out how to better focus our design improvements. So let's say, for example, the condenser was where we had the largest irreversibility. Then we could, as a designer and an engineer in designing the system, we would say, okay, we need to focus our efforts here to try to make that device more efficient to try to improve the thermal efficiency of the whole cycle. Okay, so we can use this entropy production term to tell us where irreversibilities are being generated and then use that information to try to create better designs. Very similar to what I showed at the, the very start of this lecture. Okay, let me move on to the next item. If you notice in the, the um, entropy equation up here, we have this heat transfer term, which I've just repeated down here. As I've said many times before, one of the things we need to do is uh, determine the temperature, the absolute temperature, where that heat transfer is occurring. Okay, so let's say we have this picture down here of some system, and we have some heat coming into it, and we draw a control volume that just surrounds the surface of the system, and we say, let's, let's pretend we know the temperature of the surface, um, then, and so we have the temperature of the surface, and then i just shown out here temperature of surroundings. That'll, that'll be a factor in our second part of this example. But when we evaluate our entropy, I mean our heat transfer term for this particular case, what it would be would be the Q into, and then the place where that heat transfer is occurring is right on the surface, right here, right on the surface, and we would know in this particular case, what the temperature of the surface is. So that's how we would evaluate that term. And then when we solve for the entropy production up here, using the entropy equation, that would give, give us the entropy production within the control volume, which is our system in this case. Now, the reason I bring this up is because in some instances, you don't really know the temperature at the surface very well. So in reality, you often have these, what are called thermal boundary layers. Thermal boundary layers are adjacent to a, a, a surface. Let's say we have a hot surface here on our system. So it's at temperature T surface, right? That, that T surface is occurring right on the surface of our system here. Okay, and then far away, we'll say that the temperature is the surroundings. So T surroundings is, is way out here. You can sort of see it in the, the bottom picture here. Here's temperature surroundings. In a real situation, what'll happen is you'll have some thermal boundary layer where the temperature goes from the surface temperature and it decreases as you get further away from the surface until you eventually reach the surrounding temperature. Now, sometimes you don't really know what the temperature on the surface of the system is. You, you just don't have that measurement, but you do know the temperature of the surroundings. So when you evaluate that integral term, When you draw, if, you, if I drew my control volume here, the problem is, is I don't know the temperature there. Okay, so I, I may not have the temperature of the surface. So I, would not, I wouldn't be able to evaluate this term because I, I wouldn't know the temperature there. I, I, the, the temperature of the surface in this particular case I'm saying is unknown. We don't know what it is, so we couldn't evaluate it. So instead, what we can do is draw our control volume larger, so I'm drawing it bigger here, where we do know the temperature. The temperature there is the surroundings. Now, one thing you have to be a little careful of is when I originally drew the, the heat transfer, I drew it so it looked like this, going into the system. Whatever heat transfer, so, so the, the reason there's some heat transfer is because there's a temperature difference between the surface and the surroundings. So whatever heat transfer that crosses that red boundary would be the same heat transfer that crosses the blue boundary. Um, I've talked about this before in an example, but the idea is that the, the energy that crosses that red boundary, um, it, it still has to cross the blue boundary to get there. Okay, uh, the, the example I used before is imagine the sun is shining and if I do a, a boundary here, whatever energy crosses that boundary, here I'm drawing it going out, but you can imagine the same idea going in. That same sunlight, that same energy from the sunlight will still cross this blue boundary. 
right? So the same idea holds here that whatever heat that passes this blue boundary will be the same heat that passes the red boundary and vice versa. Okay, so now when I use the blue control volume, when I evaluate my heat integral term, it'll be Q into, same heat transfer, but now I'll be using T surroundings because that's where, that's where the heat is crossing my boundary because that's a well-defined temperature in this particular case since I don't know the temperature of the surface. But you'll notice that I'll have a different amount of entropy production because in this particular case, the integral I'm dividing by T surroundings, whereas in the previous case, I was dividing by T surface. So I'll get different values for the um, integral term involving the heat transfer. So when you go back up to the integral equation, you'll see this term that I'm circling will have a different value. So what does that mean? Well, when you evaluate for the entropy production, you'll get two different values. And that's fine because this is the entropy production within the control volume. So in this particular case down here, when you evaluate sigma, it's the sigma or the entropy production inside that red control volume. It's just the system for this particular case, right? So it's just in the red, the red volume because it's the entropy production inside the control volume. But for this case, where it's blue, the entropy production is going to correspond to everything inside the blue, inside the blue control volume. So the entropy production here will include not only the system, but some of the surroundings as well. Okay, so we, we actually had to include some of the surroundings um, for this particular control volume. So our entropy production will include the system and some of the surroundings. Okay, so I just want you to be aware of that, and that in some cases, you don't always have the temperature in the most convenient place, for example, just surrounding the system. Sometimes you have to draw the, the boundary where you do know the temperature, and then just be aware that the entropy production term that you evaluate corresponds to the entropy production in the, the surroundings. The other thing that you have to be careful of is for that blue control volume, is you, you still have to evaluate these terms in the entropy equation for that blue control volume. So you'd have to look at the inlets and outlets in that blue control volume, as well as the change in the entropy in that, con that blue control volume. So you have to be aware of that, that the choice of control volume makes a big difference. Okay, I think with that, um, oh, I guess I had one more item I wanted to mention, mm -hmm. and that it concerns this, um, the, the hot and cold reservoirs that are assumed for these kind of power cycles as well as refrigeration and heat pump cycles. So I've drawn here a power cycle. We have a boiler, turbine, condenser, pump. The, assuming the pump and turbine are adiabatic, we have heat coming in to the boiler through a hot reservoir. So I've just kind of dr drawn this schematically that in the, in the boiler, this is where our heat is coming in. And I'm saying it's coming in from a hot reservoir. That hot reservoir in this particular case would be like the burning of fuel, like uh, coming in from hot gases, uh, from burning coal or gas, or if it was a solar power plant, that Q dot H, that heat would be coming from the sun. That would be a, our hot reservoir would be the solar radiation. Or if it's a nuclear power plant, the hot reservoir would be the radiation coming from the fission of uh, nuclear fuel. And then at the condenser, we have the heat transfer out into a cold reservoir. And again, that cold reservoir could be the atmosphere, could be a, a, a cooling pond or a river or a lake, something along those lines. Okay, so normally we don't really draw the hot reservoir or cold reservoir, but I'm doing it here just to reemphasize the point that the picture that I've shown there with the corresponds to really the same picture here where I have a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. And our system is everything inside that rest red dashed line. So this would be our Q dot, oops, Q dot H up here. And this would be our Q dot C down here, right? So this red dashed line that I'm drawing around the system corresponds to the same red dashed line 
shown over here. Right, so I just want to reemphasize that when we draw these kind of very abstract looking pictures of a power cycle, it, what, what's happening inside that system is really all the stuff here. And the hot reservoir is our, is our burning fuel, and our cold reservoir is our cooling pond or atmosphere. So I want to emphasize that. The other thing that I want to highlight is, again, this, this um, heat transfer term. When we evaluate the Q dot H and the Q dot C, again, we need to know the temperature, the absolute temperature at which those heat transfers are occurring. So in this case, I've, I've purposely drawn the control volume carefully so that it just touches the surface of the boiler up here at the top and just touches the surface of the condenser here. So typically, we'll assume that the temperature, it, it, it's a little un, unclear what the temperature would be um, where, the, where we cross the boundary. One possibility is we draw the boundaries such that it corresponds to the temperature in, in the boiler. The problem with that, so, so uh, as, as you go from state four and go through the boiler, the, the problem with, if, um, with putting the, the temperature of the, the working fluid in the boiler, same sort of thing with the condenser, condenser, if you use that temperature, potentially the temperature is changing through the boiler or through the condenser. You know, the, the substance could be getting hotter if there's no change of phase, um, or it could be getting colder in the condenser, for example, if there's no change in phase. So, so that's one difficulty. Um, the other thing is the, the um, well, okay, so that's, that's prim the primary difficulty. If we drew our control volume such that it touched the hot reservoir, there the temperature is well defined. It's gonna be TH and same sort of thing down here. It would be TC. Again, the temperature is well defined there, so you could easily evaluate our, our um, integral term. The issue there, again, is when you calculate the rate of entropy production, it's Sorry, it appears that the previous recording I had cut me off at the very end, so I'm just tacking on this little addendum so that you know that I was I was pretty close to the end of the, the lecture, but I just wanted to make sure that I finished without getting cut off. So I was saying that when you choose this larger control volume, the one that cuts across the hot reservoir and cold reservoir, you just need to be aware that the rate of entropy production here um, includes a little bit of the surroundings, just, just a little bit into the hot reservoir, a little bit into the cold reservoir. So just be aware of that as when you um, use TH and TC as your temperatures when you evaluate this.